Okay, everyone, welcome to the lecture on the brachial plexus 4-3. This is probably going to end up being a very short video, but probably form the bulk of what you study for the first exam because the brachial plexus is so complex. I don't need to sit here and uh, just say all these names to you on, on video, uh, but you need to know all of the different branches and how those uh, branches travel and form. So let's get right into it. Uh, so first of all, the idea is important that the brachial plexus is a nerve plexus, which is a woven set of peripheral nerve fibers that might cross over, join, and re-emerge from each other, as you can see uh, in this diagram here. So this is a drawing of a plexus where these nerves are braiding together and then uh, re-emerging in a separate distinct pattern to form a branch or a peripheral nerve. Uh, what's also important here is the concept uh, that these fibers uh, in these plexuses can form from multiple different fibers from multiple different segments. So some of these nerves might be uh, monosegmental, some of them might be multisegmental. In fact, most nerves are going to end up being multisegmental, especially in the brachial plexus. There's another concept here that's important to understand as well in terms of motor output, and that's the idea of the motor unit number. The motor unit is the number of muscle fibers that's innervated by one single neuron. So this is the same concept as the receptive field, how big of an area is innervated by one neuron, except in this case it's how many individual muscle cells are innervated and contract with the activity of one single neuron. So the more muscle fibers, the more muscle cells, fibers and cells is the same thing, uh, that receive innervation from one neuron, the less fine control you have over that muscle. So if there's a one-to-one -one ratio of neuron to muscle fiber, then uh, you can activate just one microscopic fiber within a muscle at a time and change the force of that muscle across a huge gradient. But if, uh, you know, if you have uh, a quarter of the muscle fibers in one muscle innervated by one neuron, then you have very uh, small gradations. You just have one quarter force, half force, three quarter, you know, you get the idea. Uh, so it's important to pay attention to the concept of motor unit. And this is how muscle weakness occurs in patients. Uh, it occurs by, um, you know, the damage to one or multiple lower motor neurons or upper motor neurons that can impair a fraction of the muscle fibers within a muscle at a time instead of just one whole muscle at a time. But a peripheral uh, damage to a nerve might completely sever uh, the innervation to a muscle and result in complete flaccidity or lack of um, uh, conscious control over a muscle. So these are things to think about in terms of uh, your patients. <clears throat> Uh, so let's keep moving on. So we divide up the brachial plexus into these five different regions. And these different regions are the rami, the trunks, the divisions, and the cords, and then the individual terminal branches. So the way to remember this, uh, I learned the, um, the mnemonic, the memory aid, Randy Travis drinks cold beers. Apparently he made it so he can, you know, freeze his beers now if he wants to. So Randy Travis being a uh, famous country singer, uh, not, not currently uh, in the past. Um, but it's important to note that these uh, are called rami. These are part of the anterior rami coming off of the spinal nerves. These are not roots. So most textbooks and most individuals uh, call these roots, but they are not. They are all wrong, and I am right. The roots are actually within the vertebral canal, so these are the roots here. So there are no branches coming off of the roots, but there will be branches that you have to identify coming off of the rami outside the vertebral canal. <clears throat> and, in fact, these tables that uh, are the preceding 
uh, slides contain all of that information from your textbook. Uh, so they contain the dermatome from which uh, the different nerves are arising, the names of those terminal branches, uh, and what they're branching off of. Uh, so you can see here a number of different nerves directly branching off of the rami. And so those are important to know. It's important to know what branches are coming off of the different cords and what cords contribute to different terminal branches. So this is, this is the information you're going to have to go through and perform the repetitions on. So here you can see the uh, different uh, rami trunks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and then I go through and I list and describe the individual branches and what their functions are. Uh, so this is all uh, critical information you need to know. You need to now know the muscles that are innervated by these branches. For instance, dorsal scapular nerve innervates some of the superficial back muscles, the uh, levator scapulae and the rhomboids. So now you know uh, that these muscles are innervated not just by anterior rami, but you know the specific names of the branches from those anterior rami. Uh, long thoracic nerve traveling down the, um, uh, the lateral side of the thorax uh, to innervate serratus anterior. And so highlighting those. Long thoracic nerve is important because it's an exception to the rule. Long thoracic nerve innervates serratus anterior on its superficial side, not its deep side. And this makes it prone to damage. Uh, from falling on the back or on the shoulder. When the long thoracic nerve is damaged, bruised, or severed, it results in winged scapula. The scapula will stick out of the back because serratus anterior can no longer pull it against the thorax. So that's an important sign of nerve damage. Moving on to the branches coming off of the uh, trunks. Uh, you can see those listed here. Uh, highlighted and uh, continuing to move on to the divisions. So there are three different divisions, anterior divisions, or three different anterior divisions and three different posterior divisions. The um, anterior divisions tend to innervate uh, the uh, flexor muscles, whereas the posterior divisions tend to innervate the extensor muscles. So uh, they're starting to uh, you know, segregate themselves to the directionality they need to eventually go to. And so you can see this is a blown up image of the divisions here. Now we are getting to the different chords. Um, and it, so the lateral cord is formed from anterior divisions of the superior and middle trunk. The medial cord is formed from anterior divisions of the inferior trunk. So inferior trunk is going, the anterior divisions of the inferior trunk are only going to the medial cord. Posterior cord is formed from the posterior divisions of all three trunks. Posterior cord ends up traveling up posterior to form the radial nerve, which innervates the entire posterior side of the arm and the forearm and in fact the hand as well. <clears throat> so here, uh, we see a blow up of those cords and the trunks, I mean the trunks and how they contribute to the individual cords. And so you can follow these colors on your slide and figure all that information out. So all this is testable information. And here are the terminal branches that are coming off of the individual cords and what muscles or areas they innervate. So if it's a cutaneous nerve, that means it's sensory. Uh, so start to decode the names of these structures. If cutaneous is in a nerve, that means it has sensory fibers in it. Uh, Antibrachial forearm uh, is what that means, uh, and so on and so forth. So let's keep moving on. And the animation's going very slowly. Tick tock, tick tock, keep moving, keep moving. Sorry about this, and almost done, and there we go. Uh, so now we're looking at the, the terminal branches, musculocutaneous, median, ulnar, axillary, and radial nerve. You can see these all labeled uh, here after the brachial plexus has uh, finished splitting.
<clears throat> and again, highlighting all of these on the slide. Uh, now, the key in dissection or in any images or anything, the key to figuring out which terminal branch is which on uh, the brachial plexus is to look for the M. The M is composed of musculocutaneous, median nerve, and ulnar nerve. So musculocutaneous is going to be the topmost nerve. There's going to be no nerve branching off of the, uh, the lateral cord above musculocutaneous nerve. Musculocutaneous nerve will also travel through uh, the, uh, to the flexor compartment of the forearm to innervate um, the biceps brachii muscle. Uh, median nerve is the middle portion of this M that's formed. So here I'm going to show you the M and then ulnar nerve. Don't get confused. Don't look medial first. Always start laterally because medially you'll find the median antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which is not part of this M. So always start lateral and identify musculocutaneous first. Uh, now looking at how those uh, terminal branches travel into the arm and uh, form the muscle innervations and the dermatomes of the arm. So this color drawing here shows you the spinal cord segment that uh, from which all of these fibers are originating and what um, trunks and divisions and cords uh, they travel to through to get to the terminal branches. So this is something that you should probably spend some time on and uh, potentially, you know, draw re and, and rehearse this information because uh, you'll need to know, you know, what's innervating what, where the dermatome's coming from and going to. A rule of thumb, if you, you know, blank out, is that as you descend through the spinal cord, muscle and dermatome innervation patterns uh, move down the limb. So C5 is going to uh, be uh, innervating the shoulder and the, uh, the arm, uh, biceps region. Uh, C8 is going to be the inferior portion of the hand. So you'll also have some uh, cutaneous from C5 uh, going through uh, uh, the, the arm. Uh, and then T1 uh, so if you look at the anatomical position, the lowest portion of your hand, of your, of your upper limb, is not your hand. It's actually your elbow region. So T1 uh, innervates this dermatome on the forearm. So uh, you can use that rule of thumb if you need to. Um, but yeah, this is the critical information from this lecture. And then also the rule of thumb that anterior divisions uh, innervate flexor structures, posterior divisions innervate posterior uh, structures, the, uh, the extensor structures. <clears throat> Here's a different way to look at that same brachial plexus. So whichever works for you, uh, get that 3D sense of the brachial plexus. Uh, so the cords themselves are named after where they are in relation to the axillary artery. So the axillary artery runs right in here, anterior to the posterior cord, but deep to the lateral and medial cord. So this is where the axillary artery will be just in front of posterior cord. That's why posterior cord is called posterior. And then this is uh, what the brachial plexus looks like in the axillary region. And so when we get to the dissection, this is what we want our cadavers to look like. All right, that should be it. Thanks uh, for watching. Take a look over thoracic outlet syndrome because there are different ways in which the brachial plexus can be impinged, resulting in very precise um, patterns of numbness or tingling or sensory loss or motor loss. So thoracic outlet syndrome is one of these important conditions that you need to understand and to be able to diagnose. Uh, anyway, I uh, hope you enjoy studying brachial plexus. See you later.